This lesson deals with Lab 5, a microphone amplifier. Signals coming out of a dynamic microphone are quite small. They're on the orders of hundreds of microvolts. So we're going to need an amplifier to amplify them. Another problem with microphones is that they have long cables, and those cables act like antennas, and they pick up stray signals. What's interesting about the stray signal is that it's common to the wires that go from the microphone to the amplifier. If we had a circuit that could subtract the signal coming off the microphone, we could actually cancel the noise. We're going to take a look at doing that in this lab. We used a circuit called the differential amplifier, which we introduced in ECE 201. Let's go back and reanalyze this circuit. Here I've got two inputs, a V1 and V2 with respect to ground. We're eventually going to put the microphone between V1 and V2. I've got four resistors, and I've got an output I'll call V3. That's some function of V1 and V2. I'd like to analyze this circuit and solve for V3 in terms of V1 and V2, but I'd like to have a subtraction if I could, and likewise with the values of the resistors. I do have feedback around the op amp, so I'm going to have the voltage across these terminals driven to zero. So let's use that zero volt, zero current property to analyze this circuit. I also have two voltage sources, and so I could use superposition because this is a linear circuit. Let's first set this voltage V2 equal to zero, and I'll call V3 due to that source V1 as V3 prime, like we did in ECE201. So in doing that, the resistors R3 and R4 are in parallel. This looks like an inverting amplifier, but there's an extra element here. If I could replace this with an equivalent element, Maybe we could relate this to the inverting amplifier. The current that's flowing in here is zero because of the zero current of the op amp. That's going to create a voltage of zero. Now, if I replace this resistor by a short circuit, I would also have zero volts because of the short circuit, but I wouldn't change the current that's coming out of the op amp. It still is equal to zero. I'm replacing this by an equivalent, I now have a picture that looks just like the inverting amplifier. By inspection, the gain is minus R2 over R1 times V1, and that's my output due to the first source. Like in ECE201 and in ECE202, we see that by using superposition, sometimes we find circuits that are quite simple to analyze. Take a look at setting V1 equal to zero on the next page. Setting V1 equal to zero, we're going to short circuit where that source was. And now I'll call V3 due to the second source, V3 double prime. If you stare at this long enough, you can almost see a non-inverting amplifier here. Let me be better to show you that. Let's just redraw this. Let's take this V2 with R3 and R4, draw that over here, and that's going to go to the plus terminal of the op amp. I can kind of think about flipping this picture from the minus terminal to ground, I've got R1, and the minus terminal to V3 double prime, I've got the resistor R2. What we've got is a non inverting amplifier hooked up to a voltage divider. In our last lab video, we did an equivalent model for the non inverting amplifier, and that had an open circuit between this terminal and ground, and then between this terminal on ground, I've got a voltage controlled voltage source with a gain of 1 plus R2 over R1 times, in this case, the voltage at this node I'll call V sub S. We're able to eliminate the op amp circuit, replace it by one of our basic elements from ECE201. So the voltage at V3 double prime is 1 plus R2 over R1 times this voltage V sub S. But that's just again a voltage divider because I've got the same current in these two resistors because there's no current going into the op amp. And so the voltage V sub S is R4 over R3 plus R4 times V2. So now I've got the output due to the second source, and let's put the two results together on the next page. So adding up our results from V3 prime and V3 double prime, I've got this expression plus this expression. Let's do a little bit of algebra here. Let me pull out from this expression an R4, left it with a 1, and an R3 from this, which is going to leave me with a 1, and R4 divided by R3. Again, what I want out of this circuit is to make a subtraction circuit, so I can subtract V1 from V2. If I look at this expression, it doesn't look like we can get that, but if I very carefully pick the ratio of R2 to R1 to equal R4 to R3, then this term here is the same as this term, and they cancel. So then I'm left with minus V1 plus a V2 times R4 or R3 or R2 over R1, but we're set those equal to each other. I'm going to do that with a potentiometer in this experiment. So now I've got the difference of V2 from V1 times a gain factor. So if there's any common noise on V1 and V2, they'll be subtracted and the signals will disappear and we'll just get the voice coming out of it and multiply that by a gain factor. Now the differential amplifier, like the inverting and non-inverting amplifier we talked about in the last lab, is a basic building block that you'll see in lots of audio circuits. So let's even do a model for this circuit. In other words, we want to replace all of this by an equivalent circuit. If I apply a voltage V1, a current will flow. You pick any direction you want. Go around this loop over here. Write the results. So the rise in voltage is V1. I have R1 times I1 plus 0 
plus the voltage across the resistor R4. Applying the voltage V2, you'll have some current coming out of here. Pick any direction you want, and that current's going to flow in this loop. But because the current in R3 is the same as R4, I'm going to just use the voltage divider. So the voltage across R is R4 over R3 plus R4 times V2. You can substitute this back into the previous equation. That's what I've got over here. This describes V1 in terms of I1 and V2. This is a series combination. I'm adding two things together. This looks like Ohm's law, so I'll put a resistor here. So when the current I1 flows in, I get a drop of I1 times R1. And then I've got a voltage that's dependent on another voltage, and I can use a voltage-controlled voltage source. Gain less than 1, but that's okay. You can do that. Times V2. And now our second input here, I've got the rise in voltage equals I2 times R3 plus I2 times R4, so we've got a common I2. But this looks like Ohm's law. Put a resistor here whose value is R3 plus R4. And now we characterize this pin as the current I2 enters. We'll see that the value is V2 divided by R3 plus R4. And lastly, the output is a voltage-controlled voltage source whose value is R2 over R1 times V2 minus V1, provided we balance this resistor ratio. Now this is a model that we can substitute in whenever we see the differential amplifier. The output we're using in lab can provide about 20 milliamps out and 20 milliamps in. Now 20 milliamps, if you were to hook up a speaker, wouldn't give you a very big voltage. In fact, we'll do some calculations on the next page. The reason for this is that the integrated circuit is quite small and putting that much current through it can usually melt it. What we're going to do is we're going to add a power booster to the op amp to be able to drive more current. And this power booster is going to be two individual transistors. Actually, it's similar to the structure that's inside the op amp, but these transistors have a large piece of metal on the back. This can provide a, a way to dissipate the heat that's in the transistor. This is true really for all op amps. There are power op amps that you can buy, but they're quite expensive. And this is a fairly inexpensive way to boost power to a load. I'm going to put the feedback path around the amplifier and the two transistors I'm about to add. Let's see if we can analyze this circuit. Now the current flowing in these resistors is the same because there's no current coming from the op amp. When that's true, we can use voltage divider. So the voltage across this resistor it's just going to be R5 over R5 plus R6 times V out. Here's my expression then for, for that. But because the voltage across here is zero, that's also the same as this voltage. In other words, the rise in voltage equals the drop of zero plus the voltage across R5. I can solve for V out in terms of the input here, which I called V4. So V out is equal to V4 times the reciprocal of this, which is R5 plus R6 over R5. Or you could just write that as 1 plus R6 over R5. We get the same expression we had as the non-inverting amplifier. But we're able now to have a current booster. Let's do some simple calculations and I'll explain a little bit how the transistor works. The reason we're putting a power booster on here is that most op amps can only provide about 20 milliamps of current. This is true no matter what the op amp is, except for a power op amp, which has a much bigger physical case to it. With an 8 ohm speaker, if you put 20 milliamps through it, plus or minus, you have a swing then of 160 millivolts peak, and then peak to peak twice of that. If you put that across the speaker, it's barely audible. So we put these power booster transistors on our op amp to increase our current output. Let's take a look at a little bit of an analysis of that. We have two transistors. Actually, one is on and one is off, depending on the sign of the signal. When the input's positive, the top transistor is on, and between the B and E terminal, there's roughly a drop of about 0.7 volts DC. But between the collector and the emitter, there's effectively a current source that's about 50 times this base current IB1. So what's coming out of here would be IB1 plus 50 IB1. Now, what's coming out of here? Well, the most that can come out of here is 20 milliamps. So now we're pumping about 1.02 amps out of the transistor terminals. Now, some of the current goes this way, and some of the current goes in a load. But if I pick these resistors large enough, then most of the current's going to go in this direction. So if most of the current goes this way, then the most voltage we could ever see here, if nothing came back this way, would be that 1.02 amps times... 8 ohms, which would be about 8.16 volts. If we had a 9 volt power supply, we could then create a voltage less than 9 volts across the speaker, but a positive voltage. We're going to see in the next page that we can also create the negative of that. So my peak to peak output would be twice this. In terms of power out, what I'll be getting is the peak voltage divided by the square root of 2 would be the RMS value. If you square that and then divide by 8 ohms, you're getting about 4 watts out. Quite a bit of significant power increase by just adding these two transistors. Let's take a look at the bottom transistor when the signal goes negative. And when the input goes negative, the output goes negative, as we did from our analysis of the non-inverting amplifier. So current's going to be coming into our power transistors. 
And with a negative voltage here, you have a negative voltage here, which means current's also flowing in this direction and this direction. So the current here plus the current coming from the speaker, and all that's going to be equal to current entering my transistors. Now, the model is very similar, but all the signs are flipped on it. So between the E and B terminals, I've got a 0.7 drop roughly, like before, between the B and E terminals, which stand for base and emitter. And then between the E terminal and the C terminal, which is the emitter and the collector, I've got a similar current source with, again, around 50 times the current that's coming out of this terminal. Okay, so this current is equal to this current plus this current, which would again be 51, but now times IB2. And what can IB2 be? Well, again, this op amp can source and sync about 20 milliamps of current. So again, we've got about one amp that we can pull back into the power transistors and back really to the power supply. That's going to swing my signal minus 8.16. So I could symmetrically put out my output voltage for a symmetrical input and be able to get about four watts out. A lot more than you can with the individual op amp. I want to add a volume control to our circuit and put this between the differential amplifier, which you're going to hook up to a microphone and this power amplifier. The reason to do this is because the size of the signal coming off of the microphone is going to be varying depending on how loud someone's speaking. Another problem I have with my non-ideal op amp is that there are possibilities of getting small DC voltages showing up at the output of an op amp. If I take that voltage and apply that to this power amplifier, which is going to have a gain of around 11, I'm going to get a DC voltage across the speaker. And that's going to force the cone to go in one direction or another rather quickly. It's going to create what's called a thumping effect. Put a blocking capacitor in there to stop that from happening. So we'll use a pot as a volume control. We characterize a pot in the previous labs as a two-valued resistor whose value is a percentage of the total pot resistance we called alpha, which goes between zero and one. And the remaining part over here is one minus alpha times our pot. So whatever voltage is here, call it Vn, and here's my V4 going to the power amplifier. The voltage here then would be a voltage divider of alpha R pot over the sum of these two. But when you add these two together, the alpha and minus alpha cancel, and you just get R pot, and you wind up getting that the voltage at V4 is Vn, the voltage here, times alpha. And so when we're in the middle position, we get half the voltage. When we're at a quarter of the position, we get a quarter of the voltage, and so on. I want to be able to pass the audio range, which starts at about 20 hertz. The impedance of this capacitor needs to be smaller than the pot resistance once I get to 20 hertz. Then V3 will equal Vn. We're going to use a 50k pot in lab. Take the impedance of the capacitor, which is 1 over J omega C, and take its magnitude, it's 1 over omega C, or 1 over 2 pi F, and I want that to be less than 50,000. If we use 100k pot here, we'd have 100k here. So solving for C in this equation, putting C over here and putting the 50k over here, I then get C is greater than or equal to 1 over 2 pi F times 50k, and if my F is 20 hertz, we're looking at about a 0.159 microfarad capacitor. In our parts box, the nearest standard value is 0.22 microfarads. Now, when you build a circuit, you may experience some problems with unwanted oscillations. This is actually very common in electronic circuits. This is where I've got a power supply, a long wire, and then a nonlinear load with respect to the power pins. And this can happen in analog or digital circuits. Now, the theory for this is pretty complicated, but the solution is pretty simple. And so our IC is a nonlinear load at its power pins, and if you take that along with the inductance of the wire between the power supply and our IC, we can get an effect that's called an oscillation, which creates a non-periodic waveform, and this causes our power pins to just be all over the place. Now again, this is a very complicated theory, but there's a very simple solution, that is to use a capacitor um, across the power pins, shown below. Remember from ECE 201 that the voltage across the capacitor doesn't want to change instantaneously, so we're going to use that fact to fix up this problem. So here I've got my power, and I've got some wire between the power and my integrated circuit. This is particularly troublesome when you have like an automobile where you've got a long cable between the power and the car and electronics get hooked up to it. So we're going to put a capacitor very close to the pins of the op amp, back to ground, about 0.1 microfarad. And this is going to squelch or suppress the oscillations. In this lab we looked at problems with long wires and electronic circuits. In power supply connections, they can cause oscillations on the wires of our integrated circuits. In microphone circuits, they can pick up unwanted signals that get amplified. Some of the concepts that we covered were differential amplification, power supply stability, common mode noise cancellation, and adding a power booster to our op amp. The laboratory techniques that we're going to take a look at are measuring RMS voltage with an oscilloscope, and the idea of what's called one-shot triggering. When you come to lab next time, there'll be a quiz on these background notes, the video itself, and the lab procedure. And this is Lab 5 Microphone Amplifier.